Hey! Awesome. Thank you again so much for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be out in the community. It was a little bit tough not seeing anyone for a few months, but now we're, we're doing these virtual meetups and it's feeling much better because we get to engage with everyone out there. So uh, if you don't know me, my name is Stephen Fluin. I am a DevRel lead on the Angular team at Google. Uh, and my job on the Angular team really has two parts. Uh, the first is to help developers and organizations be successful. So give you the best practices, give you the guidance, share as much as we can about things that are going on on the team. Uh, but second, it's really to reflect the needs of our developers. So it's understanding what it's like to be someone that's building applications every day so that we can reflect those needs onto the team and make sure that we're evolving Angular in a way that really solves problems for everyone. One of the things that I, I love to talk about is this idea of what the Angular team values. And we, we've been saying this for a long time, but it generally breaks down to apps that users love to use, apps that developers love to build, and a community where everyone feels welcome. And the first point here, apps that users love to use, is a really, really important one because users are actually the thing that we figured out about most as developers because we are sitting in front of our computers we're sitting very far away from our users we don't use the same devices as them we don't have the same context as them we don't have the same understanding as them and so this is a, a journey that i think we all need to take up and really consider how do we make sure that we're uh, taking care of our users and their needs. And so one of the, the best ways to think about your users and to understand their problems and their challenges and their successes is to think about the performance of their applications. And so I, I do like to always take a little bit of time and acknowledge why and how performance matters. Uh, if I was speaking to a business person, I might say, performance matters because you're going to increase conversions. You're going to increase the value of the work that you do by focusing on performance. Um, because if you, for example, make an application work better and faster so that it actually loads on their phone, they're more likely to have good experiences and positive feelings about your brand, and they're more likely to buy something or perform their action. We also see that people end up forgetting about people like employees and team members, because we know that a lot of Angular applications are being built out there, uh, not necessarily for public-facing users, but for internal users. And we always think, oh, this is a captive audience. They have to use whatever we build. And so their experience doesn't matter. But we, we find that it ends up mattering in the end, right? Because a happy employee is going to do better work. They're going to perform better. And overall, the company's going to be more successful. If not just your users are happy, but your, your team members are happy. And so uh, there's a really, really nice set of metrics that the Chrome team have been pushing this year. And these are called web vitals. And so there's three of them. And it breaks down into largest contentful paint. Uh, so first up, largest contentful paint, this is the idea of what is the largest paint the browser has to do? Because generally, the largest paint is going to include the most content. And so that's probably the one the user cares about most. Uh, in the past, we've seen metrics like first contentful paint and things like this. This is a continuing journey from the Chrome team to figure out what metrics are most meaningful to users. Uh, second is cumulative layout shift. And so this is a measurement of all the things that you render on the page, how much do they actually move? And so if you render something at the very top of the screen and then it moves down and then it moves down and then it moves it down, all of those things hurt your user experience because it delays the ability for the user to understand what's going on and delays their ability to actually engage meaningfully with an application. And these first two metrics can be measured very easily, right? You can set up a Puppeteer script that actually goes out and measures these applications. You can see these in the Chrome Dev Tools, all those sorts of things. But then the last one is really interesting, and it's first input delay. And so this one is really, really based on the things that a user is actually going to end up doing. And so when a user does a first interaction, whether that's a clicking on something or a keyboard input, how long does it take for you to respond to that first action? And so there's no way to actually automate this measurement because it's really, really dependent on what your users do and what they're trying to do. And because it's all going to be dependent on the things that you've designed into your application, right? If the home page is a block of text, right? If I'm building Wikipedia, the first input delay is going to be very, very different than if I'm trying to build a business card website where a user is going to click buy. And it's going to be very, very different than if I'm building like a Google search where I want someone to actually search. So really understanding the context and meaning of your application, what you're trying to achieve, using these metrics can be a really helpful way to understand, are my users having a good time with this. And in Angular, what we see is that performance of runtime applications is actually really, really good. And so what ends up mattering most to most user experience is actually startup time. And the number one factor in startup time is bundle size. And so what we're looking at here is what's called a source tree. And so this is a mapping of all of the 
content of the bundles that I'm shipping down to the browser. And so you can think about this as I write a lot of code, I pull in libraries, I pull in tools, I pull in ecosystem, things that make my application rich and engaging and viable. But then all of that code I have to ship to the user. And so measuring the size of that code directly affects the startup performance and the perceived feeling that a user is going to have about your application. That's why we spend most of our time focusing on startup performance, not runtime performance. So we said this really is the number one factor. Um, a lot of people think this is just in terms of network time. So if I have a fast network connection, I don't need to worry about this as well, at all. But that's not true. Bundle size affects not just download time in terms of like how much throughput do you have, but also it affects parse time. Because if I have a very, very fast internet connection, but a very, very slow CPU, which is something that we're seeing on a lot of mobile devices around the world, my application can still end up feeling slow because that slow CPU device has to parse all that JavaScript and then execute it. And as I said, we oftentimes as developers forget about this context. We, we don't develop on these slow machines that our users end up using. We have fast internet connections. We have dual monitors. We are in kind of the best possible experience as a user. And so you end up not noticing these things. And so you end up not caring about these things. One of the, the cool things that we have at the Google offices is there's actually different networks you can join to simulate different connectivity levels. So you can actually put your, your laptop or your computer on a slower network in order to simulate and actually feel for the users that are experiencing those sorts of latency and connectivity issues. There are two settings in your Angular JSON that I want everyone to kind of open a VS Code terminal and take a look at. And so in your angular.json, you're going to find this source map key, and you're going to find this named chunks key. Uh, and they're both default by false, and I think that everyone should turn them to true. And uh, if I had my way, I would probably turn them to true in the default project setup. What these two settings do is source maps is going to take a kind of full end-to-end -end understanding of what is the code that you wrote and what is the code that you pulled in and how does that map into the JavaScript that you're actually shipping to production. And by using source maps, this gives you really nice debugging tools. Like you can actually see that uh, an error that happened happened in your template, but you can also use that to understand where is the bundle size in my friction bundle coming from. And the second one, it named chunks. This is a simple setting that just says, whenever I have a lazy loaded chunk, give it a name based on the file system where it came from. By default in production mode, this is obfuscated, so you just get this big long hash. But I really do think there's really no downside in terms of security to turning on name chunks, even for production bundles. And I find it's much, much easier to debug without having to go and look up, okay, what chunk was that? And let me attach that in my tooling, et cetera. This does expose the file system that you had used to actually build the application. It does expose a little bit more information to your users about what lazy chunks loaded in the uh, dev tools. But I don't really think that's a big deal because people can see these things almost uh, easily anyway if you look at the module names, et cetera. If you look at the US, and I, I don't know the statistics for Israel, so if someone has these, uh, I would love to hear them. But over 70% of web traffic in the US actually comes from mobile devices. And so again, hammering in this idea of empathy and understanding what your users actually experience is that most people aren't using your website on a desktop computer. Most of them are not using it on a laptop. They're using it on this mobile form factor. They've got unreliable internet connectivity. They've got low, lower CPU devices. And we need to bring that with us every day. And this number is, is higher across the globe. We saw in China, it was over 90% from the, the statistic I saw. Another thing that I want to point out about startup performance is that it is not static, right? The startup performance you have on day one of your project is not going to be the startup performance you have on day 100. And that is OK, but you have to understand and make this a conscious thought. The Chrome team has actually worked with a lot of different websites to go and improve their user experience by uh, improving startup time. And so what they did is they actually helped these companies and these teams decrease their bundle size. And it worked really well, right? Users were happier. The conversions were better. But what ended up happening was after that project ended, teams started backsliding. They started building new features. They started pulling in new imports and new dependencies. And over time, their bundle sizes started getting large again. And so budgets are one of the key fundamental techniques that you need to understand and use in order to make your startup performance reliable over time. In Angular, we have this really nice key in Angular JSON file where you can actually set a number of different budgets for your initial load, for each script, for all the scripts, all those sorts of things. And you can warn at a level, and you can give an error at a level. So our defaults of 2 and 5 are a little bit um, loose, right? Well, you should probably make those a little bit more uh, tight and aligned to the application you're actually building. But this is the way that you can make sure that instead of accidentally increasing your bundle size and making your users experience worse, you can make that a conscious decision. Because a lot of us don't even spend time thinking about startup performance. And there's a lot of really important things to do there. One of the things you can do as well is really staying up to date with Angular. It 
is really, really easy to stay up to date with Angular. We have a lot of tooling. We spend a lot of time making sure that it's a very smooth, easy migration from 8 to 9 to 10 and so on. And we find that most applications are actually staying up to date. And this is something that we're really, really happy about. And this is a reflection that we believe that says we're actually doing a good job of making it easy to stay up to date. But what happens is every time you update to the latest version of Angular, we're making improvements behind the scenes that are improving the performance of your application. For example, with uh, Ivy, in version 9, we actually made application generated code much, much smaller. Again, we did this in version 6. We kind of do this over and over and over, where we are continuing to push Angular forward so that your applications are faster without having to change a ton of code. And so this is something that's really important to us. So when you don't have these things being conscious, when you're not focusing on these things, there are a way, few ways that this can go awry. And I was helping a team debug their bundle size. And they ran a build, and I was flabbergasted to see that their main bundle, the bundle necessary to actually load the home page of the application, was over 15 megabytes. And so we did the kind of the standard techniques. So we pulled up a source map, and we started looking at the bundle size. And what we did is we found out that they had been doing something which seems pretty reasonable at first thought. But when you get into the actual understanding of the implementation, it kind of fell apart. So what they were doing is they were actually using SVGs as data URLs in their CSS that was scoped to a component. And so there's actually a couple things happening here. So when you use an SVG embedded in CSS, then you actually have an extra parse, right? You have to parse the CSS, then you have to parse the SVG. But when you component scope that CSS to a component, now we're actually embedding that CSS in JavaScript. And so you actually had a couple different translation layers there. And so it was a really, really simple fix once they knew what was going on. Once they knew what was going on, they said, hey, we actually don't need these to be data URLs in our CSS. Let's just pull those out and write them to disk as static files. They did that, and they cut the vast majority of their bundle size almost instantaneously. And this, this kind of gets at the kind of core problem that a lot of developers face is that fixing these things is really easy. But if you're not even paying attention to it, it's very, very easy to mess up too. And so it's a really, really important thing to, to understand and know. And so one of the things that you should be careful with is always think when you're going to import a new library, a new dependency, what are you bringing in? What is the cost to your application for bringing that in? This used to be a big problem with RxJS, where if you import it in the wrong way, that would actually bloat your bundle size, you'd accidentally pull in all of RxJS. We worked over the last few years with the RxJS team to actually improve RxJS so that you can't accidentally import the whole thing. So that was the whole 6.0 migration in RxJS where there was a compatibility package and all those sorts of things. This happens all over the place. Uh, another place that we see it happening is with Material. If you use the default theming in Angular Material, you're actually pulling in all of the CSS for all of the Angular Material components. And you probably don't need all of the CSS. And so if you're building a high-performing application and you're, you're building a large-scale app that's very customized, very optimized, then you should actually start thinking about, let's actually go into that theme and only pull out the parts of the theme that we need in order to have our application look and feel great. We also see this happen a lot with third-party SDKs. I'll, I'll call out Lodash and Moment, uh, Moment in particular. I, I've seen this more than a dozen times where teams will pull in Lodash and, or excuse me, they'll pull in Moment and they'll accidentally pull in the locales a couple times, two, three times, which there's no reason for it. There's no functional benefit to doing that, but it just bloats the bundle size. And so by understanding kind of what you're doing with these imports and double checking these things, you can make it better. Uh, another area that I, I have to call out sometimes is marketing JavaScript. We oftentimes build consumer-facing applications with this large kind of marketing focus where, where we've got Hotjar to track users, and we've got live person for little support pops, and we've got surveys, and all of these little things end up adding up. And we often see that the marketing JavaScript coming from the marketing team is far bigger than the actual functional JavaScript, but it has the same effect on user experience. And so definitely look out for those sorts of things. And so I'm going to go ahead and do a demo here. And what we're going to do is we're going to dive into an Angular project. We're going to play around with it a little bit. We're going to add in a source map explorer to actually take a look at the bundle size. And then we're going to actually try and improve the budget of that application. So let's take a look at what we've got here. So this is a brand new, fresh ng nude. CLI application. So you're going to see source, app, all of this should look very, very default to you. And then I've got ng-serve that I can run in the background. So let's actually do a couple things to make this application a little bit more engaging first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run ng-add at Angular Material. And I'm doing this on the fly. Uh, so hopefully the demo gods are with us today. Otherwise, things will kind of fall apart. I have to correctly spell Angular. Otherwise, your code basically just isn't going to work. Uh, what this is going to do behind the scenes is it's going to add Angular Material. It's going to install a theme. It's going to uh, 
uh, let's say we don't need the typography, but we do want animations. Uh, and this will, again, set up and configure Angular material in our project. And if we take a look at Git, we can see it's made a bunch of changes to our package JSON. It's made changes to our yarn lock. And then we'll see in a moment that it's also going to make a bunch of other changes to our app module to pull these things in, our Angular JSON, all those sorts of things. And so I want to do one more thing. So just installing Angular material is good, but we can actually very quickly take advantage of a bunch of different components. And so I'm going to use ng generate to do this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say Angular material colon material dashboard. And I'll just create a component called dashboard. So this is one of the starter components from Angular Material. So we've now created a component called dashboard component. And now let's reference that dashboard component from our index.html, excuse me, from our app component here. Just replace everything here and say app dashboard. And when I run ng-surf, what's going to happen is instead of getting up that default application from Angular, we should actually get an Angular Material default dashboard that we can actually take a look under the hood here at the dashboard. And we can see in the HTML5, it's got a matte grid list, it's got matte tile, it's got matte card. So we are kind of extensively using Angular Material here, both in terms of the HTML references as well as in terms of the module references. So when I did that generate, it actually imported all of the modules that I needed to go ahead and use those things. Uh, so while this is compiling in the background, I'm also going to do one more thing. Uh, we talked about how you should always configure Angular JSON. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I'm going to say source map true. I'm going to see named chunks true here. So both of these, again, source map and named chunks are really, really helpful features if you're going to be debugging your, your application and looking at the bundle size. All right, so that build is almost done here. And as soon as it is, we will take a look and actually create a uh, take a look at our application and see if it's rendering properly. All right, here we have it. So we've got our little dashboard. We've got nice animations. We've got this nice layout. So we've we've created a bunch of code. We've added some new dependencies. So let's actually stop this development and take a look at an ng build dash dash prod. So we've got right now a 3.8 megabyte JavaScript bundle. That's just the development bundle. You can totally ignore that. What really matters to our users is what's going to come out in an ng build dash dash prod. And because we turned on source map explorer in our, or excuse me, because we turned on source maps here, we're going to get out all of those source maps mapping from the generated JavaScript back to its origins. I'm also behind the scenes going to do one more thing here. I'm going to go and I'm going to yarn add something called source map explorer. So source map explorer is our recommended way of setting up source maps and understanding and analyzing source maps. There's a bunch of other tools out there like webpack bundle analyzer, which we don't actually recommend. Webpack bundle analyzer is applied at an earlier stage in the Angular compilation process where, for example, we run Terser after the bundles are generated. And so it can categorically misrepresent some of your bundle size. So source map explorer is the one that uh, kind of handles the process end to end and is what we really recommend. So what we should be able to do as soon as that build completes, looks like I stopped it somehow. Whoops, I must have hit the wrong key here. All right, we should be able to run source map explorer and then we'll, uh, I'll just run that through NPX so that I don't have to use the global version. And then what I'll do is I'll pass it the disk folder and then I'll pass it the main star.js. And we might need a 2015 here. I don't think we do anymore. I think as of Angular 10, we don't actually do ES5 builds by default anymore. Yep, looks like we're not doing any ES5 here. All right, so this is just the NGCC compilation, bringing all of these packages that we have installed in Yarn or in, in the Node Modules folder up to uh, the Angular Ivy compiled versions. And let's go ahead and run this as soon as that completes. So again, this, all of this compilation just happens once. So if we have to do this again, this should go much, much quicker. Um, while we wait for that, what I'm going to do, oh, here we go. It's complete. So what I should be able to do is run this command. And if it found the right file, there it is. So we have now taken a look at our application. And we can see my bundle size is now 421 KB for my main chunk. A bunch of that is coming from animations, a bunch of that is coming from router, a bunch of that is coming from material, CDK, and so on. And what I can do is I can look at this and understand, hey, I don't actually need Angular Material. I don't need that dashboard on my homepage. And so I can use this information to understand what's going on in my application and pull those things out and take those cool features that my users actually want and make them loaded at a different layer of my application. So maybe after I log in or 
be after I access some sort of information that requires a dashboard. And I can intelligently architect my application to take advantage of this. One of the other things I want to do is, so we now see that our bundle size is around 420 KB. So what I want to do is I want to go ahead and add this initial. So I'm going to say 420 KB. I'll just say 400 KB. We'll start warning. Uh, and then you should warn me if I ever get above 800 KB. And so now that we've set that up, when I actually redo this build, what we should see, and we won't actually wait for this, but what we should see is that my bundle size is over the warning threshold, but not over the error threshold. And so I, as a developer, I'm going to see that my bundle size has gotten bigger. So if I undid this change and I reverted that Angular Material uh, dashboard that I added, we should actually get back under that bundle size limit, and we shouldn't see that warning anymore. All right, so we've taken a look at the source map. There we go. Warning in budget succeeded maximum budget for initial. And if you just use the completion, you can actually see that there's a bunch of different types of budgets. So if I cross out initial, you can see there's all, all script, any, any component style, any script, initial, et cetera. So lots of different really great ways to configure that. All right, let's jump back to the presentation here. So as I alluded to, you're going to be using these bundle size information. You're going to be using these source maps to actually design your application and architect in a way that it is a, a better application. So lazy loading is your key utility here that you're going to use throughout your application. Because generally within Angular, your module layout is going to determine your lazy chunks. So when I do a build of production in a more complicated application with name chunks turned on, you're going to see we've got all of these different bundles. We've got an admin route. We've got an admin. Uh, admin route, we've got uh, admin editor, we've got authentication, CFP. And that is what you want your application to look like. You want your user to pay for as little code as early in the process as possible. So this is really easy in the Angular router. So if you just uh, configure your route using this load children key and then pass in a dynamic import to the module, the Angular compiler, or excuse me, the Angular CLI is going to use Webpack under the hood to resolve that dynamic import and split all that code from the home module as well as all of its dependencies into a lazy loaded chunk. Uh, so this is that key piece. If you're seeing component references, those are all synchronous, and that pulls in all the code into the chunk. Whereas if you see load children, that can be lazy. Um, when you think about lazy loading, I always kind of go through a, a checklist in my mind. So admin routes, oftentimes we have functionality like those dashboards, right? where maybe we don't need that for the home page. You can lazy load your editor interfaces. Anytime you're pulling in forms, that is a bunch of bundle size that you probably don't need on your home page. But you can also lazy load your home page, right? The home page is functionality that is a little bit interesting because that, that's your initial route. And this can be a little bit counterintuitive. But even if it's the same bundle size to load both your application as well as your home page as a lady which was a chunk, you'll actually improve the performance of the application because you're yielding back to the browser one extra time. So the parse time is going to be the same, the network time is going to be the same, but you can yield back to the browser to make sure your application is as engaging and as good a citizen to the user's device as possible. So we're really at a point where every module in your application should be lazy loaded, and you should consider this. There is also a really, really easy way to do this in the CLI. So we used ng-generate to create a starter component using Angular Material a little bit earlier. But if you do this command, ng-generate module, and you pass it a reference to another module, and then you pass it a route, it actually sets up a lazy loaded module for you automatically. And so let's actually go ahead and try this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump back to my terminal, and we're going to run an ng-generate module. And we're going to say module app.module. And we're going to say route. We'll just create maybe an about route. And we'll call the module about. And if I've done this correctly, what it should do is it should create a about module. It should configure that route that module for routing. So we can see that routing module here. It's created a default component for that so that we can actually render something in that routing uh, reference. And we set up the app routing module for lazy loading. And we can take a look at that app routing module here. That it's automatically set it up with load children. So this is now a dynamic part of my application. And if I did another build, we would get out a different chunk just for that about module. So I won't wait for that. We'll just keep going here. Part of what you're doing in lazy loading, part of the intent here is to maximize the amount of code run. And one of the ways you can understand how much of your code is being run is using dev tools. There, there's this really great tool that's directly built in called code coverage. And so if you open dev tools and you go to the three dots in the bottom panel and you click on that, you're going to see coverage. And what coverage will do is it'll take out your JavaScript and it'll actually instrument it so that every line of JavaScript that's run 
you can see what's run and what's not run. Every line of CSS, you can see what's applied, what's not applied. Uh, and that can give you really interesting insights to what parts of your application are running and what's not. So by default, you're going to see around probably about half of your bundle is not running. And the intent behind that is that most of those code, if you just kind of go line by line and looking at what's not running, a lot of that is error handling. And so take a look at that and really understand, OK, if this is maybe 80% unused code, maybe I've done something wrong and my application in a Hello World app uh, is not the same comparable situation. The last thing I want to talk a little bit about is this idea of understanding JavaScript serving, because we are really good at building great applications, and we can think about the structure and the flow of our application. But at the end of the day, DevOps comes into play and, and plays a really important role in shipping good applications. And so the number one thing I, I like to point out is content compression. You can see here, we're looking at an app module or an admin module that's about 923 KB on disk, but it's almost four times smaller over the network when we use content compression. So it's 241 KB. So we're saving three quarters of our bundle size just by having content compression turned on. And the reason I have to mention this is because that around 13% of sites are still forgetting or failing to content compress in terms of the sites that I'm looking at. So I still have to mention this. Uh, if you're using a CDN or some sort of content host, all of this will happen for you automatically so that we highly recommend that. Uh, HTTP2 is a really another really interesting DevOps technology that can make your application start faster. So in general, HTTP 1, it makes a new TCP connection for every request. So for your home page, your index.html, your JavaScript files, every time that is a new request from the browser. Uh, whereas HTTP 2 only uses one. And so this saves on overhead, networking, DNS, and just makes things a little bit faster in terms of the overhead. But HTTP 2, and you can actually detect HTTP 2, you'll see H2 in the protocol. And there's also some newer protocols that are being worked on that'll make this even better. But if you are using HTTP already, there's a really cool technology you can use called server push that lets the browser and the server actually work together to figure out the files that you need and when you need them. So uh, I want to explain just really, really briefly. You could have the best network connection in the world that has really, really high throughput. You could download gigabytes in seconds. Uh, but if you have high latency, your users are still going to have to wait seconds for that those gigabytes of data or terabytes of data or whatever you're trying to load. And so if we look at a traditional page load, um, we are hit both by throughput as well as by latency. Because if you look, first we have to load the index.html, and then the browser starts parsing it. And it says, hey, I need this main.js file. And now I start loading that main.js file. And that main.js file says, hey, I need this chunk. And then the browser says, OK, well, now I'm going to go get that chunk. And so each time we do that, we have an extra round trip. And so if I have a high latency connection, all those round trips can add up hugely. What HTTP 2 allows you to do with server push is you can actually say, on the server, when a user requests index.html, I know they're going to need all these other files. I know because I designed how this app is going to get loaded. And so I know that I'm going to need to load that main.js, the styles, the CSS, all these things. And I can say, let's push those down to the user, force them into the cache so that when the browser actually realizes it needs chunk one.js, it's already sitting in the local cache and it doesn't have to do a round trip to the server. I'm seeing in the comments that uh, server push is a broken mess that causes more problems than it solves. It absolutely can, right? One of the things that they ended up seeing was that applications that use server push or configured it wrong ended up pushing way more than they needed to, and you actually decrease the performance of the application. So this is one of the areas where I think the situation is a little bit different in Angular because we deterministically know, because we control so much of the build system, which files a user is going to need. And so uh, that is definitely something you should take a look at. Um, and this is something that it's, it's, uh, should be a concern for you. Um, if you're using something like Firebase, uh, server push is really easy to configure. You just set up in your hosting config a key of type link, and then you say, value, here are all of the, the files that we should be uh, registering as preload, either script or style. Differential serving is a really important strategy if you have to support older browsers. So one of the things that we saw as part of my demo today is that version 10 doesn't even generate ES5 bundles anymore. And uh, if you are coming from an older version of Angular, you probably still have a browser list config that is generating ES5. but it's up to you to determine which browsers you need to support. What Angular does behind the scenes is we take a look at your browser list, and if any of the browsers that you are attempting to support via browser list require ES5, we're going to do a, ES, a modern JavaScript build and then transpile and down level down to ES5. Um, so the, the idea here is we actually have the capability now to support browsers that support modern JavaScript and those that don't. And you do this via differential loading, where we build both bundles, and then the browser decides which one it actually needs to load. And so the key here, idea here is let's not send our IE9 polyfills down to Firefox users, right? Like we can make a more bespoke, a faster experience for modern browsers, which are most browsers at this point. Um, so if you require older browsers, just configure them in your browser list RC file, and we'll automatically do that. Uh, otherwise, we'll just ship modern JavaScript to everybody. 
Uh, another technology to be aware of is called Angular Universal. Uh, this basically allows you to load that Angular application in memory effectively in the node runtime rather than in the browser runtime, uh, and then generate to a string and then send that string down in advance of any sort of bootstrap. And this is a really good technology because it can improve, improve the perceived load time. Uh, and it creates machine crawlable HTML. So if you want uh, your cards to share up on Twitter or Facebook or something like that, uh, Ingo Universal is a really important technology for achieving that. Uh, I'd also say consider server-side rendering and pre-rendering. Uh, what we saw in 2019 was that almost no one was doing server-side rendering with Angular. But from my data, it's more than 25% of sites are server-side rendering. So this is a, a huge growth in terms of the number of people that are doing this. And so we think that this is a really good technology for people to consider. Uh, if you think about Universal today, it can actually increase the time to interactive. So it actually slows down your app because now we have to render both the painted H the rendered HTML, we have to paint that out to the browser, and bootstrap the application and replace everything, which can result in double impressions if you have ads. And it can slow down and prevent everything from being interactive until the entire JavaScript app is bootstrapped. But this can still have improvements for the perceived performance of your application. That perceived performance is really, really important because it affects how a user feels about your application, as we've talked about. So use Universal carefully, but if uh, you need server-side rendering, if you want to make your application feel fast and render fast machines, Universal is a really, really good technology. Uh, and you can do things that make this even faster. So you can cache generated pages. You can do things like pre-rendering, so make it a build step instead of a, a requ on request step. And you can do things like only serve universal to machines. And there's a lot of new technologies around uh, pre-rendering and universal. One in particular I like to call it is called Scully. It doesn't use universal necessarily. It can use universal, but it uses Puppeteer, so you can pre-render an Angular application. Uh, and one of the benefits is it doesn't run in a node context, and so you don't have this uncanny valley where if you attempt to reference local storage or something like that, everything just kind of falls apart. So uh, as we look to the future of Angular and we look to the future of the performance of our applications, uh, I definitely see more lazy loading. So this dynamic import is a great standard. It's supporting Webpack, it's supporting Angular. We see that expanding into more places. So what if you could, for example, lazy load your reducers, lazy load your actions, things like that. Uh, what if you could lazy load components? Uh, and then there's also another technology called module federation, which theoretically will allow us to more finely split up and build our application in smaller chunks, giving us a little bit of independent deployability, which can make our application a little bit faster there as well. Uh, but I want to end just by saying, Make sure you're having fun. Performance is really important, and you're considering your users' needs is really important. But there are lots and lots of slow applications that users are very used to. And so if you can kind of make sure that you're doing better than other people, make sure you're focusing on it, and really keep on focusing on delivering great experiences. If you do have some super rich dashboard that your users sit in eight hours a day, maybe don't worry as much about startup performance. Maybe focus on making your application engaging and valuable to your users. That is it for me. Thank you so much for having me, and I think I'm sticking around for some Q&A. Yes, uh, so uh, Stephen, Toda, first of all. Um, and uh, we already had some questions uh, during your sessions. Um, and uh, Shai asked, uh, so first of all, before we answer this, um, if you have any general questions related to Angular, uh, the future plans, uh, whatever, so uh, feel free to ask them uh, in the chat. Um, and let's start with the, the question from Ishai. Um, so basically, uh, I think you sort of answered this where uh, you spoke about the improvements you did with Angular 10, but maybe you want to elaborate even further. Yeah, no, so I think this is a, a long-term goal for us is to continue making Angular uh, smaller in every case, which includes the uh, hello world case, for which is really important for things like Angular elements. So if you're trying to ship a custom element, uh, you you care about making sure your bundle size is very small. So this is something that where the IV work that we did for a couple of years is really an enabler for that. And now we're trying to figure out priorities and roadmap in terms of how do we actually start taking advantage of that, but also start delivering on some of the other things that people are expecting from us. So this is definitely part of the vision. It's definitely part of the goal. And we're going to continue working on that in the, the long run. Awesome. And uh, we also had a question from Udi. Uh, I think he wasn't certain uh, for source maps and name checks whether uh, they, he should enable them in production. Sure. And, and so, so by default, they are on for development and off for production. But what I say, and this is totally your personal choice, right? So it depends on, on what your needs are. But I found it to be very, very helpful in production to see the name chunks and to see the source maps. Because I oftentimes integrate with like 
production monitoring where those source maps being just available on the server is helpful. The, the only fear is it gives away file names and it gives away line numbers in your original source code. But I think for most client-side applications, that's not a big issue because if you're relying on users not being able to see the JavaScript you or understand the JavaScript you're executing, you, you might be in a, a losing battle of security by obscurity. So I, I have found these things to be very helpful in production, but it, it's totally up to you whether or not you want to ship those things out. There, there's really no performance downside to that uh, from a user perspective. Actually, I had a one case where I accidentally uh, shipped full source maps to production so people could actually see my uh, entire source code. And you know, I think sometimes it's embarrassing for people if they have like uh, um, uh, internal jokes or some internal jargon in the comments and they don't want everybody to see that. Um, I, I think probably you and I run into that more often than, than most developers because I will say most users out there are not looking at source maps. And maybe maybe well, having a funny <laughs> joke with, with all your developer audience is a, a good way to recruiting recruiting mechanism. It sounds like a fun company to work for. Yeah, um, I, I know that many companies nowadays just put some uh, message in the uh, developer tools console when you open it. We are hiring. This is the URL to apply. Um, so yeah, that's another kind of marketing strategy. Make your um, source maps available and put funny comments for potential candidates. Um, yeah, another question uh, from Tali Barak, and I think this is also related to another question she asked about improving the build uh, build time during development. But here she's asking about the impact of uh, name chunks uh, on uh, build time. Sure. So I, I'm not aware of names chunks affecting build time. That would be surprising to me because it should just theoretically be a hashing that that's shouldn't really slow things down much. I will say source maps is very CPU intensive. So if you are trying to speed up your build, uh, then then that would say don't actually generate uh, source maps for production or don't generate them in CI. Uh, so that that would be one area. In terms of improving build time, this is something that we're focusing on. This is one of the things that that are in our, our backlog. We, we want to make it faster, especially for at scale. We, we have many, we've heard about in over the last few months, many applications where, hey, I've got 2,000 components in my application and I've got like six lazy loaded chunks or 600 lazy loaded chunks, right? Depending on the case. And that can be very slow to build. And so that's one of the things that we're, we're thinking about. The good news here is that IV is actually the enabler. So because of how IV refactored the compiler behind the scenes, we can actually now do kind of individual module compilation, or individual component compilation. And so we should be able to take advantage of that at some point in the future in the, the long run. So uh, a little bit of the answer is turn off the extra settings that you don't need as part of the build, like source maps. But then also just stay up to date with Angular because we're going to keep making this better. All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, actually, I also have a tip here, which is not related to Angular or any other framework. Now, um, I see that you are um, you are working from home today, right? Always. Yeah, always. So <laughs> nowadays, uh, more and more of us uh, are working from home. And I recently switched from my laptop to a desktop PC where I can have like a much more beefier CPU with like 16 cores. And it really made an amazing difference. I used to have like a light notebook, which was OK. But I used to wait for uh, NPM install and uh, all the build processes. And now I can at least browse Facebook while uh, the build is running. <laughs> so uh, yeah. yeah, so I, I, it, I would consider, really consider investing in a BFR machine and that that can also help a lot with uh, development time. Um, and Saif asks whether uh, lazy loading initial route, what benefits can it give to the application? So in a, a very simple application, it is going to give you very little benefit because yielding back to the browser when you have a blank page isn't really going to do much. But for example, let's imagine you are using server-side rendering, where you've sent down a set of static HTML, then yielding back to the browser in the middle of bootstrapping can actually help, right? It, it can reduce long frames, all those sorts of things. So it, it, it's a advanced strategy that has a little bit of minimal, minimal benefit, but it also makes your application more changeable 
in the future. So I, I've often seen where the module that I started out with as my home module ends up not being my home module after two, three months. And so having to rewire my application for that different architecture later was harder than if I had just designed it up front so that any module could be lazy loaded. Yeah. Um, so um, I see that was, uh, I think, the last question. So uh, let me ask one of my own. Um, when you look at the future of Angular, what thing excites you the most? What are you looking forward to the most? Uh, I think I'm, I'm looking forward to a lot of different things. I think I I've been asked so many times this year about module federation that it's it's almost a, a running joke for me now. So I think this idea that people want to be able to violate the concept that our application is a single cohesive whole and say this part's not a part of the cohesive whole and actually design and maintain an API layer between parts of my application is is a really interesting use case. And so that that's the one that I'm spending most of my time thinking about. Cool. Um, so uh, I, I actually learned a few things, uh, a few cool things during this talk, like uh, the CAD coverage in uh, developer tools. I didn't know about it. Now I'm going to uh, spend all my evening looking at uh, the CAD coverage of uh, various modules of my app. Thank yeah, you. For I, I want to create like a, a machine learning tool that like takes your coverage report and then just pulls out all the error handling. <laughs> so like pulls out all the code you're not using because. In my head, it should be as like simple as for, for applications. Load the application, exercise it to the extent of your usable API, which you could do theoretically via Puppeteer for, for certain use cases, and then, then remove all that code. It's not executed, right? Like theoretically, that should be possible, but it's, it's much, much easier said than done. So if someone wants to build that tool, I would love to use that tool. Well, you know, maybe we don't even need any error handling in production. I mean, I think up to ES3, there was no uh, try and catch in uh, JavaScript. So it's something new. Maybe we shouldn't use that. That, that. that sounds great until you have like an HTTP request that might fail, or like you're trying to access an API that might not exist on the browser. Like there, there's so much that can go wrong. I think that uh, tonight I'm going, after um, doing all the uh, uh, profiling, I'm going to uh, open. Yes, uh, ECMAScript uh, submission and suggest to remove a catch from promises and from the language to help with that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you could just get rid of half the code, like it, one of the things that's always kind of blown my mind, have you, have you ever heard of Wine? The, the, it stands for Wine is not an emulator. It's to run like Windows applications or Windows API applications on Linux and Mac. The thing that has always blown my mind is whenever a method, like it's not a complete re-implementation of the, the same API. It's a partial implementation. And the way that they start, it's they have all the, they know the names of the methods that need to be called, and they just say stub to do. And the fact that so many programs work perfectly without half of their methods running <laughs> just kind of blows my mind as a programmer because I always assume I need every line of my code, right? I wrote that, like I have to have every single line of my code, but like the fact that wine just kind of works without most of the without a huge swath of the implementation probably says a lot about kind of the emergent nature of these applications that we build. That's true. I'm actually I'm now uh, one of the projects I'm working on is an Arduino simulator so it can basically uh, simulate uh, Arduino boards and it's written in JavaScript. Yeah, that's a small Arduino board here. Um, and I, when I started working on it, I tried to um, get to a point where I could execute an Android Arduino application. Um, and I only had to implement a very small subset of like the CPU features. And I got most of the applications running already. It's amazing how many features, like for instance, it has like this thing that is called uh, timers, which keeps track of time. And they have like three timers. And with just one timer, I could get away with most of the applications. It's amazing like how many features there are in the platform, in this case Arduino, that applications are not actually using. Yeah. And I mean, once we start removing those to improve performance, the nightmare, the nightmare is going to become debugging, right? <laughs>
Right. Uh, so um, I think that uh, we are done with the question. Uh, somebody uh, says handlebars forever. Yeah, there is a use case for handlebars as well. Um, I think they are still used in uh, email templates. Um, so, oh, yeah. Uh, again, a question about the name check and source maps, uh, if there is any cost in performance. Um, so there, there's absolutely no runtime cost. There is a huge build cost for source maps. So there is a build cost for source maps. So probably uh, you shouldn't really care about that if your builds are running in CI, right? Maybe. Uh, some like It totally depends. I know a lot of teams that do care. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that's a good point. If you enable source maps for production, it's going to affect your build time, and uh, name chunks shouldn't. And Udi is asking, I, it, like I could totally be wrong about that. I mean, if, if Tali's experienced that, maybe it's, it's a thing. Um, Udi is asking, what about uh, the time between versions? Still every six months. Yeah, I mean, so we we've talked in the past about moving to a yearly model, um, but right now we are still six months. So uh, Angular 10 came very fast after 9 because uh, 9 took longer than expected. And so what we did is we did a, a short, small release in order to kind of get back on the, the calendar release that we had. And so we're really trying to get to a place where we have, we can almost pre-announce all of the dates for a upcoming year. Obviously, we're, we're not there, right? Like delays happen and things like that. And so always, always never expect those things on, on a specific date. Uh, but that's kind of the, the vision that we have is we want to get to a predictable release cycle so that everyone's staying up to date, staying on the same uh, version. And we, we think most people are actually staying up to date. And like, theoretically, small releases are easier to adopt. And so uh, like this, this kind of goes back to the idea of, oh, it's really hard to release my code. Well, if you do it more often, it actually gets easier, which is counterintuitive, right? Yeah, I tend to upgrade uh, usually when uh, it gets to the RC stage, even though with 10, it was pretty quick release. So I waited until after the uh, final release. And uh, yeah, usually there is like one or two hours of work at most fixing. Uh, sometimes the main issue is with third party libraries that, that, that uh, don't catch up. But I think that's the major issue I'm experiencing. Uh, yeah, for, for most people, it's uh, TypeScript updates. Like the, the If they rely on all the strict flags, uh, TypeScript keeps getting better and better at catching bugs. And then it's like, oh, I, I w didn't know I had these bugs, but thank you. But if I'm not mistaken, you can now tell TypeScript to ignore a specific file. So if you have a specific clients that trigger a bug because it's of new version, you can just like to do it and do the upgrade and deal with that later. Hmm. I'm, not, I'm not aware of that. That sounds very cool. I think I read about it in the um, feature hmm. list for 3.8 or 3.9, ignoring your errors. It's always a good sign. <laughs> All right, so uh, thank you so much, first of all, uh, you and the team for uh, building and keeping up uh, this uh, great framework and also for sharing all this uh, experience with us. And uh, I hope to host you. Uh, oh, there is another question, so that will be last. Uh, so, um, oh, that's actually an interesting one. I will translate it for you, even though you can already see the keywords in it. In it. Um, Oz is asking about uh, the um, concept of functional programming, this methodology that is uh, coming, becoming more and more popular, um, and is asking whether uh, we are, th there is any thoughts, there are any thoughts to um, implement something like uh, they have in hooks where you can write all your code using uh, functions. Yeah, so uh, we're, we're talking a lot about these sorts of things, and I'll, I'll address two kind of specific areas where, where we're thinking about this. Um, we, we actually have challenges, because a lot of our community wants Angular to be more functional and more reactive, but a lot of our community doesn't want it more reactive. Like A lot of people want it less reactive. And so we're, we're trying to strike the right balance between opinionation, flexibility, those sorts of things. So we, we're trying to find a, a happy path where we don't end up having like two ways of building Angular applications, but still satisfying both of those needs. And so that's that's a really hard thing for us. The other one that we're we're thinking a lot about is things like um, 
higher order components where you could like create a, a component on the fly, like which you could do in a more functional way, right? As, as long as you had the JP, or JS APIs in order to create a component, you could do that. Um, and so we're, we're thinking a lot about those sorts of things. Ivy, again, was an enabler that will allow us to figure out what should the best practice be? How do we enable people to do these things and then let them do it? So basically, uh, you sort of build the infrastructure and now you are trying to figure out what's the be best way to build uh, this yeah. thing and what yeah. it should be built. Yeah, because uh, for example, I mean, a lot of people want um, lifecycle events to instead be observables instead of methods on the class, right? And we could totally do that, but then that like, does that create two ways of building Angular applications, which is something that we, we generally try and avoid? Or is there some way that we could work with someone like NGRX to provide hooks or to, to, over, to use the, the wrong term, right? Like I'm not referring to React hooks, but give other people the ability to hook into the system in the way that would allow them to write applications the way they want. Well, yeah, I think like, uh, in my opinion, um, like React already sort of solves this kind of working with functional components. And as you said, people have like different opinions and it's good to have like different solutions for different kind of people. Um, so it's good, but there's also a cost to it. Like which- No, which I, I mean, not having Angular as a one-stop shop, but rather say Angular is for people who like to build applications this way. And then if you want to use functional components, then React does this great, so. Oh, sure. And then maybe uh, working on better interoperability between the framework, uh, we had like web components, which sort of, it's- Help, help a little? Uh, it's it's sort of, we are almost there, but it seems like we are not getting there um, with Angular elements. And I think React already also had like a similar initiative to have uh, better some support for uh, web components. All right, so I think uh, with that, uh, we will uh, wrap up um, and uh, wish everyone a great day. And thank you again, Steven, Todaraba for joining us and uh, enlightening us. Yeah, thank you again. Talk to everyone soon. Bye-bye. Yeah.